And because I do, my life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, come on, everything I touch will turn to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Put your hands together for those joining us live online on Facebook. We welcome you to our service. You know, we believe that God is with you as he's here with us. So believe to hear from him and we know you'll be blessed. Amen. Bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. We ask that you shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us glean from the entire service, whether it be in worship, and even now as we sit to hear your word, exactly what you know we need in order to make adjustments in our lives. And we covenant to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Before I go into the Word of God today, um, for the specific message, I want to share another testimony. I want to share someone's story, their faith, and I want to share their victory. Amen? Amen? And the reason why I do this is because of what the Word of God says. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, <coughs> excuse me, the Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. And as we are, are going to receive Holy Communion today, one thing that we should be encouraged by is that the Bible says that we overcome the devil because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. And when we partake of Holy Communion, we're reminded that his blood was shed, that his body was broken, his blood for our salvation, and his body for our healing. But the scripture doesn't simply say that the way we overcome the devil is because of what Jesus did on the throne. The Bible specifically says that's one part of two things that cause us to be overcomers of the devil. Notice he said, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and, and that's important, it's a conjunction, it's also by the word of their testimony. Everybody has a story. I don't know what your story is. If I sat with you, got a chance to talk with you, I'd get to learn a little bit about who you are where you come from, and what you've been through that got you to where you are today. And I can tell you the truth. Not only would that story encourage me and help me, no matter the struggles you've seen, no matter the difficulties you've faced, not even, not even no matter the victories you've experienced, but the fact that you went through something, and I may be going through something, that gives me the confidence that I can overcome as well. Amen? And so that's what we do. We tell each other's story. I've got a testimony here that came in, and I just had to read. I know this is long, so please bear with me, but I believe it will bless you. But the reason why I read it is because you may be going through some things that she went through, and she had victory, so I believe you'll have victory too. It says, hey, Pastor Stan, so in December when I wrote my vision, I set out to do one thing that I haven't been able to accomplish yet, pay off my debt. I've struggled with debt for 15 years and never really got serious about paying it off. It took discipline on my side the beginning of the year to become a more faithful tither and making decisions necessary to stop hemorrhaging my wallet but God really started to answer my prayer. You didn't know you could use the word hemorrhaging in a text message. <laughs> she said she, she made the decision at the beginning of the year to become a more faithful tither and to make decisions necessary to stop hemorrhaging of her, of her wallet, but God really started to answer my prayer once I finally 
was obedient and completely naked with my husband about the true extent of my struggles with finances. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but once I was, my money started coming from every direction. From an opportunity for extra military duty to winning a $18,000 fitness challenge and an unexpectedly bonus from the Army Reserves, in all, $43,100 has come in. Since January and as of July 1st, I am 100% debt free and owe no money to nobody. <laughs> as iron sharpens iron, this experience has made me better and strengthened my marriage as well. Thank you for all of your teachings on the subject. It has been a humbling experience and I look forward to sharing this knowledge with others. Advice to anyone struggling in this area. If you really want it bad enough, my testimony is to dig deep. Humble yourself, do your part, and God will bring you the rest of the way. He did not leave us to struggle on our own, but the breakthrough isn't coming until you prepare your storehouse to be ready for it. So get ready yourself. Thank you for always delivering the word in a way that we can understand and grow. Love you, Pastor, and love my faith family church. Amen. <laughs> wow, what a blessing. That's Sister Anshua. Uh, her husband's here, uh, um, uh, Brother Stephen. And uh, they've been a great blessing to the church volunteers. And she normally serves in the children's ministry. But praise God. We overcome the devil, not only because of what Jesus has done, but because of what God has done through our brothers and our sisters. And that gives us confidence because God is no respecter of persons. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, you all are ready to get into the word of God? Yes. Amen. Did we pray? Yes. I know we made our confession. Yes. Now, did we pray and make the confession? Yes. Pray, pray, pray. pray again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this anointed word. We receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm concluding the series that we've been on called Like Jonah. And so if you would open your Bibles with me to the book of Jonah, chapter 4. Uh, we've been on this series for, this is the fifth week. And I believe this conclusion will bless you. <clears throat> in Jonah, chapter 4, and verse 9, God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow. It came up in a night, and it perished in a night. And should I not have pity on Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 100 and 20,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and left and much livestock. This is actually the last verse in the book of Jonah. Now, one of the things that people love about Faith Family Church, I get to talk to the visitors often in the Welcome Center, and one of the things that visitors most often say is they, they really preach appreciate that we preach and teach the word of God at Faith Family Church. Amen. That this is not a church that just reads one verse of scripture and then says a lot of powerful things, but that we literally go line upon line and word upon word from the word of God. Amen? Amen. Well, the story of Jonah was written for your benefit. This is not just a history book like in class and you, you just happen to have an account of a guy whose name was Jonah. God intentionally caused this man's life story to be recorded so that you can be benefited by it in one way or another. And so I challenge you to glean from it. We've been examining, is there anything in us that's like Jonah? In other words, when he went through what he went through, is there anything that we can learn and detect in us 
that may be the same way. So for example, we started in Jonah chapter 1. If you know the story, this is the guy that was swallowed up by a great fish. In Jonah chapter 1, we find Jonah was running away from God. And so this series has been trying to find out if you are like Jonah running from God. Maybe all of your life you know that God has his hand on you. He wants to do something with you. He wants to use you, but you've been running from him. Well, Jonah ended up going through a very bad storm. It was so bad that they thought they were going to lose their life. Matter of fact, it was so bad that he literally, at the end of the, at, at the storm, said, just throw me into the waters and the storm will stop because I know it's because I'm not doing what God wants me to do. My question to you is, are you going through what you've been going through in life, all of the tough times, because you're not in the direction that you should be where God is concerned. You know, a lot of times we look at the difficulties financially in our marriage and we think that it's this reason or it's that reason. But could it be because you are not where you're supposed to be with God that you're going through that what you're going through? It's not all the time, but could it be? The other thing we noted about it is that he got to the point where he didn't care whether he lived or died. And whether you're here today or whether you're listening online, I know what that's like when tough things and really, really bad things can happen to you and leave you in a place where you feel like it doesn't matter if I live or die. That's a very dark place. Right, and, and, and here's the unique thing. Rather than obeying God, he'd rather die. All he had to do was tell him, well, take me back to Nineveh because that's where God wants me to be. And the storm would have stopped immediately. But he said, you know what? I'd rather you all just throw me overboard than for me to do what I believe God wants me to do. Well, God in his mercy prepared a fish to swallow him up. He, he was thrown into water and immediately he thought he was going to die. This fish gets a hold of him and it keeps him into a place where he comes to his senses. I believe right now God's just been waiting for you to come to your senses. He's been protecting you through all kind of stuff, all kind of bad situations. He's got an envelope. It's still kind of stinky in the fish. Come on. It's still kind of dark and slimy, but he's keeping you alive because he wants to use you for a very serious and a great purpose. Finally, he came to assistance. In Jonah chapter 2, we have a prayer, and he prayed to God. He said, all right, God, I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. In that moment, God spoke to that fish and commanded it to release him. And that fish spit him out on dry land. Amen. And that's how simple and that's how easy your situation can go from bad to good. Just with one decision in your heart to commit to do what God wants you to do in this life and things can turn around, as it were, seemingly overnight. But sure enough, he went into Nineveh in chapter 3. He did what, he's, what he was supposed to do, and the people repented. You'd think he would have been happy for that, but he was angry. Matter of fact, we go into chapter 4. He was so angry that he went outside of the city, and he said, that's why I, that's why I ran away from God in the first place. I knew that God was going to be merciful to this people and forgive them. And he sat outside of the city just waiting for something bad. Have you ever had somebody... Did you wish that something bad would happen to them, but God was merciful to them? And it kind of upset you that God was being merciful to your husband, and you know he was wrong. And you were just waiting for God to strike him dead. But God was merciful, and you just waiting for something. To well, he sat outside that city just waiting for something to happen, and it got really, really hot, kind of like it is right now. I think yesterday it hit 100 degrees. At least my, my phone said it was 100. You know, sometimes the car can say it's much more, but man, it was hot. I kind of think it's hot now. <laughs> and sure enough, it got really hot, and God caused a plant to grow up overnight and provide a shade. I remember one time, this was about four or five years ago, I was working outside on a project, and it was like July, August, in Houston. And um, I'd been out there for days, it was me and this other guy. And it got so hot, I'm walking around, I'm walking across the parking lot, and I smell something burning. Smell like, you know how the iron, you leave the iron on the clothes, and it smell like the, the clothes are starting to, come on, y'all, you ever, you kind of smell the clothes? 
I smelled my shirt, felt like my shirt was under the arm. Well, at least two people thought that was funny. You ain't never worked outside if you don't know what I'm saying. I can remember then, that's in that same week, I laid up under a truck like a dog just to sit under the heat, just to get out of the heat. Amen. I guess y'all got air conditioning jobs. It was hot. And he was so thankful, Jonah was so thankful that God made this gourd to grow up overnight. He didn't know that God made it, but he was so thankful for the plant. Oh, man, this is so nice. You know, and, and, and then the next night, God gave a worm and caused that, that plant to, be, to, to die overnight. And Jonah was so, listen to me, because God, God came to him and talked to him about a plant. And I'm talking to you about a plant today for a specific reason. He was so angry about the plant, God asked him, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Remember this about God. God never asked you a question for his benefit, right? Because he's all-knowing. He knows everything about everything. So anytime in scripture or in your life you see God asking somebody a question, you don't remember Adam, where are you? As if God didn't know where he was. But God was trying to get Adam to get right about something. Just like God is asking Jonah this question so Jonah can get right about something. Just like God is asking you today so that you can get right. Listen to Jonah's answer. Jonah said, not only why should I be angry, I'm angry enough to die over what happened with this plant. Let me ask you a question. What are you so angry about in your life? Is it right for you to be angry? You doggone right, I had, you doggone right, I should be angry about this. You don't know what they did. Now, 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 now be careful. Because if God is asking you, maybe somebody did something to you. Maybe somebody said something to you. Maybe on the job, they, you know, this, they handled the situation. And it turned out negatively. And you are really angry about what happened. And just as a pause, I believe God might be asking you that question. Is it right? And be careful now. Because Jonah's immediate reaction was like, you doggone right. I have a right to be angry, and I'm angry enough. You know, sometimes you get angry enough to cuss. I know nobody in here. Amen. <laughs> but he was so angry, and for him, he was angry enough to die. When you look at all of what God has done and how merciful he's been in your life, Oftentimes, it removes your right to be angry about something somebody else has done. Amen? But it still shows that Jonah was not in a good place in life. And I can't tell you that this story ends well. And I don't want for you this series to not end well like it did for Jonah. I don't know if at the end of this exchange that Jonah finally got in a good place with God. Because right now, he's sitting on the outside of the city waiting for something bad to happen to the city. He's angry about it. But God says to him, you had pity on a plant. You know what the word pity means? You cared about the plant. Now, I've got plants. I'm kind of like a green thumb. You know, I've always had plants from the time I was in college because my, my, my mom and my dad, they like plants, so I just grew up with plants. So you can't have a house without a plant. There's a few people like right. And I got plants right now. And uh, my wife wanted me to put two of the plants outside. Well, they call house plants, but I didn't tell her that. I didn't tell her that. I didn't tell her that. You know, we're, she, both of us are from the north, and so maybe the, she thinks the climate is sufficient. Well, sure enough, I put, I put two plants out, outside, and they just got a little bit of the afternoon sun. And I feel so sorry, because one of them is now kind of all burned up like, you know? 
I have pity. I have care. But think about it. He says, you've had, you, you care, you're concerned about a plant. Should I not have had pity, care, concern for over 120,000 people who don't even know their right hand from their left and not even counting the livestock? See, had they not repented, they would have been destroyed, destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything would have been wiped out. But what Jonah did not realize was that he was the cause of hundreds of thousands of people's lives being saved by his obedience. Here's the lesson, and here's the point. I won't be before you long today, so I pray that you get this. On the other side of your obedience could be somebody's salvation. On the other side of you being willing to do whatever it is God's calling you about could be some child's future in the balance. When you talk about 120,000 people that don't know their right hand from who doesn't know their right hand from their left? Matter of fact, if you don't know your right from your left, raise your right hand. <laughs> Everybody, well, wait a minute, because I got a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a one-year-old, and I bet you they don't know their right hand from their left. Right? What is he talking about? There, there's, there's, because of Jonah's obedience, children's lives were saved. <clears throat> Go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. This is one of the chapters that we read last week, and I thought this was just profoundly powerful. I didn't tell you the title of the message. The title of the message is Running from Commitment. I'm going to challenge you today to make a commitment. Now that you know that God is calling you, that he's inviting you and I to do something for him, that will result in somebody else's life being blessed, I want you to make a commitment to your calling. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 44, the Bible says that then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. I want to challenge you to make a commitment. This is a very interesting story in Matthew chapter 25. And it's in the same chapter which we read last week. We were looking at a different part. But this is about the fact that in the end of time, God is going to separate all of the people of the earth like the sheep and the goats. On one hand, he's going to separate the sheep, and on the other hand, he's going to separate the goats. And those that were on his right hand answered him this way, and those that were on his left answered him that way. What was he referring to? He's talking about the fact that as often as you have done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. My question to you is, what in your life are you doing for God? What in your life do you do for God? Because that call of which you are called by God, you know, as it were, he was on the cell phone, he is inviting you to do something on his behalf. You don't have to do it. Everything he gives you, he gives by his grace. It's unmerited. You can't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to, to lose it. He gives it to you out of his grace. But when he calls you, folks, it's because he wants something. And if you answer that call, it means you're going to ask him, well, Lord, what is it that you want? He is going to invite you to do something that will impact somebody else's life. In this particular story, let me point it out and break it down. In verse 44, he said, let me, matter of fact, let me back it up. He said, there's going to be this certain group of people that will answer him, Lord, when did we ever see you in a bad situation and not help you? 
Let me ask you a question. If you were leaving the, the, the church today going home and you saw God and he had a flat tire, would you stop and help him? <laughs> I get one strong amen. You know, think, well, God wouldn't have a, he's perfect. <laughs> I'm just saying, if he had a flat tire, or if he was hungry, or if God needed a, 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 you know, something as a, if he needed help, would you help God? Most of us, if we knew that it was God, we would help God if we knew that he needed help. But because we don't recognize him as God, we don't realize that he needs help. They ask him a question. One day you and I will stand before God. Don't be there to ask him this question. Well, when did I have an opportunity to help you? And I didn't help you. He answers that group. He says, well, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and my sisters, you were refusing to help me. In your life and in my life, there ought to be things that we do regularly that we don't get paid for. I got one right and one amen. Come on, hold on now. We're not done yet. There ought to be something that we volunteer to do. I'm, I'm trying to be very specific. So if you're here and you don't volunteer for nothing, not at church, not at the office, not at the, the community center. If you never do anything other than what you want to do and get paid for it, then you're in a position where you are refusing to help God. Oh, it's quiet in this church. I want you to reach down in your offering envelope and grab this Dream Team card. And if you don't have one, then uh, they're going to come out. Because I'm going to ask you to make a commitment today. This is like a commitment card. And I know you're getting a little bit nervous. Why? Because oftentimes people run from commitment. People run from commitment. It's like that guy that's been dating that girl for like seven years <laughs> and refuses to get married. Why? Well, he's running, come on, from commitment. It's one thing to know that God is after you, to know that God is calling you. It's another thing to even know that you have responsibilities. But you don't run from making a commitment to it. Why do people run from commitment? Jesus was in a situation in John chapter 2. I want you to see this. <clears throat> In verse 23 through 25, now when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the, Pas at the Passover, during the feast, many people believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. Why? Because of what he knew. He knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of him because he knew what was inside a man. I want to back up there for a moment because the Bible says that Jesus didn't make a commitment. He didn't commit himself. Why haven't you committed yourself to your church family? We are literally brothers and sisters of Jesus. There are probably 30 kids right now being ministered to in children's church. They don't know the difference. Well, some of them do. Some of them don't know the difference between their right or their left. And somebody is helping them. When the end of time comes, they'll be able to stand up stand before God and say, I helped you when you were in children's church, when you were in the parking lot, when you came in the front door, I helped you to your seat. I helped you. My question is, what are you doing? And again, not everybody uh, has, you know, has a calling to do something in the church. Most of us do. But, but if you're not doing anything in your community, what's your excuse? If you never spend any time giving back, then you're in a place where you're running from commitment, and God's talking to you about it today. So I just want to briefly ask, answer the question, why do people run from commitment? Why would you struggle to fill out a card to, to do? There are simple things that, that God needs. Uh, I just had to run to Home Depot to buy some, uh, some fans this morning on the way to church. 
I would have liked to have been prepared and focused to preach the message, but, you know, it just so happened that uh, we need fans for the children's ministry. You know, in, in between service, I went home and got a child gate so that the fans can blow in the doors without the, the, the door being closed. Come on, somebody. And there are tons of things that God needs. Oh, you say, well, God needs it, but Pastor Stan, that's just you. You. <laughs> and remember, he says, as often as you have done it to the least of these, my brother, this is my passion right here. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about the fact that God instructed somebody to do something, and he said, if you don't do it, their blood is going to be on your hands. That is a very strong word in the Old Testament. I don't see that in the New Testament. So I don't preach that people will go to hell because you don't obey and do what God tells you to do. I don't see that in the New Testament. He's very gracious and very merciful. But consider this. You can play something softly for me. What if your obedience to do something for God. What if it's the difference between somebody going to hell or going to heaven? And then I want you to think about your own family for a moment. When I ran home to get the child gate to set up so the church, so the kids can not escape while the door is open so that they can have a little air, I saw a lot of people out there on the streets Normally, I'm in, in the church between 8.30 and 12.30 while we're here. And I don't realize, like the guy that was in front of me just kind of looked in a, in a daze. Music bumping real hard. And I'm thinking, if he doesn't accept the gospel, he's going to go to hell. Can I talk to you all for a minute? I'm thinking about your relatives right now who are at home, cousins. They don't have nothing to do with God. I'm blessed because you're here. You're here worshiping him. He can get your attention. If you were to answer the phone, he would ask you, hey, there's something that I need help with. And in his mind, he's got your loved ones that he's thinking about. He's trying to get to them. But he needs a link to do that. He needs someone's obedience that's going to give him a legal right to send somebody across their path. You can't beat God given. There were 120,000 people that were saved from destruction. Because one man obeyed the call of God on his life. Will you stand up with me? I wonder who. I wonder whose eternity is hanging in the balance while you're enjoying the comforts of your Christianity. When you die, you are going to go to heaven. Okay? You got it. Jesus saves. You believe. All right? But there's somebody that's not in church today. They're on the street. They're in the office. They're working. And they're giving no attention to the Almighty God. And he wants to use other people to reach him. He wants to send them to the prison. He wants to send them to clothe them. He wants to, to, to reach them. And he says, as often as you do it to others, you're doing it to me. I didn't get to it, but 
one of the number one reasons why people run from commitment is because of an ignorant assumption. Jesus didn't commit because of what he knew. And you're not Jesus, so you don't know everything there is about everything. But I can tell you one of the reasons why we don't make commitments is because of what we don't know. Sometimes we don't know what that commitment means. We don't know how far it's going to take us. Some of us want to know the whole picture from the start. Come on, y'all got to help me now. I'm like, okay, now, God, what is it that you want? And you want to see the whole picture before you even take the first step. God doesn't work like that. You know, when God called Abraham, he said, and he was trying to save his family. Matter of fact, he said, I'm going to bless you, and in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. I am so glad that Abraham answered God's call. I'm so glad that he didn't have to get the whole story. Next week, we have registration, orientation for equip classes. There's some of you that there are several men in this church that are supposed to be pastors. They know it, but they're comfortable where they are. And they don't want to make that kind of commitment because of an ignorant assumption. But God's been dealing with them for the last five weeks. Glory to God. And if you're ready to commit, because he's not, it's not going to change. His path, his plan, his purpose for your life, for your future, for the thousands that hang in the balance, it'll still be there. But if you're ready to commit, next week we got class. Amen. Um, man, love you guys so much. Thank you. Another reason why is selfishness. But the third reason why people don't commit is because of fear. And sometimes it's the fear of failure. I don't want to make that kind of commitment because I might mess up. And it has a lot to do with how you see yourself. As a failure. There's a reason why people run from commitment. That's what I was waiting for. Let me finish with Abraham, and then we can go. When God called him, listen to what he said. He said, Abraham, I want you to get out of your country, away from your kindred, unto a place that I will show you, and I'm going to do these things. Listen to that statement. That's like crazy. Because we live in a day and age where we got Google Maps. And it will instantly tell you how long it will take for you to get there and what path you will take along the way. It will even give you optional paths that may take a little bit longer this way or a little bit faster. And you can even select when you don't want it to cost you anything like paying tolls. Come on, somebody. But it doesn't work like that with God and his destiny for your life. You literally have to say yes before you know what you're saying yes to. Am I preaching good today? I'm preaching good. Listen to what he said. He said, Abraham, I want you to get out of your country, away from your family, and I want you to go to a place that I will show you. What that means is leave now by faith, and along the way, I'll start giving you pieces to the puzzle. 
And that's the same way it is for me. There are there's certain aspects. I, I'm very, very clear about the calling on my life. But there are certain things that lately God has been revealing to me about my calling. And I believe that the half is untold. There could literally be hundreds of thousands of people's lives affected by my obedience. And I'm challenging you. Let's do it together. Let's obey God together. And let's help him be what he can be in the earth. Will you bow your heads? I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment.